Lonnie, thanks so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. I know you are constantly booked and you, you work night and day and even weekends. So we appreciate your time. My pleasure. And how long, speaking of which, how long have you been in this industry? Over three decades, <laughs> darling. So how how are you able to have such longevity in a field that seems to just chew up and spit people out, you know, on a daily basis? I don't have a life. That's how. <laughs> um, I think it's more or less you. I have made this my commitment. I've always wanted to be in an animated movie and got kind of distracted into games. And that goal of achieving that animated movie is still my carrot that keeps me going. So when you say animated movie, you're talking about like a feature film. That's right. Do you feel that having so much experience and always being so booked and so busy with games and the like, does that make it more challenging to try to audition or land parts for these major motion pictures? Not at all. The challenging part is having an agent that either gets those auditions, you know, which I have a plethora of different agents. And oftentimes, you know, I will get an audition from one that you don't get from another. Or if you're not in maybe the top 10 agencies that people are thinking of, or you're not a celebrity, uh, you won't get a chance to audition. And that's what keeps you back. It's not me being too busy at all. Yeah, I understand exactly what that's like. I mean, we, we deal with that a lot in animation, too. We sometimes have to choose between pure talent or pure celebrity because the distributor always wants to have that celebrity attached to the to the movie or the video or even the game. And yeah, the fact that the celebrities are now willing to work for scale, as my agent told me, is also kind of making it um, more competitive. Do you feel that uh, video games offer more opportunity to be judged exclusively on talent more so than maybe a feature film? <laughs> That's a good question. I think that talent can be put in quotes in this business period because it's who you know and who you schmooze with sometimes. It gets you work no matter what genre it is. So I believe that, again, people don't credit the script writers as much um, and the directors. And those are the things that can either make or break it before we even see it. Speaking of all these projects and some of the things that you have worked on, what are what are a couple? N name like one or two or three of some of the higher profile projects you've worked on that you really enjoy. In animation, I've worked on Rugrats all growing up and Justice League and, of course, the wonderful animation you did, Zap Squad <laughs> and the Sands of Time, and a lot of the Blizzard games like all the World of Warcraft series, StarCraft 1 and 2, Diablo 1, 2, 3, Hearthstone. I've, um, the ones that I've had repeat parts have been Soul Calibur as Ivy. Nancy Drew for 16 years, Rouge the Bat, Sonic the Hedgehog, Mortal Kombat as Sindel and Shiva, and a lot of characters for Star Trek Online, Neverwinter Dungeons and Dragons, and um, Skyrim. A lot of those are pretty popular, but I think the popularity kind of ebbs and flows depending on what year it is. Exactly. And it's so interesting. Uh, I think uh, even though people may not know your name, I guarantee – Everyone that's reading this article and that will be listening to this interview has heard your voice <laughs> on numerous occasions, myself included. I mean, I'm familiar with your work and know, you know, having known you for a few years and having worked with you, but I, I still get surprised. Like I'm a big Skyrim fan. And once in a while I hear a voice and I have to ask myself, oh my gosh, is that Lottie? <laughs> like <laughs> like you you pop up everywhere and, and that's so cool. For example, when I did Skyrim, I was told I was a dark elf and uh and I had no script ahead of time and they would flash up on the large screen TV a highlighted line and you'd never seen it before, go, boom. And you know, they said, just make her very British and bitchy. Okay, so uh, I thought she was just this person that would accompany you, and it turned out they used that the same voice for all these various characters of the of the elf species, and I could have done different things. I had no idea they were doing that, and then I was also nocturnal, and then they said, "Oh, we have this other character. It's called Night Mother, and um, it's going to come out of a coffin. We don't really know much, you know. Just what would you do for that?" And I said, "Well, I can." kind of do this thing where I do multiple voices. Like, Good. We'll do that. Good. We're over. See you later. Bye. And then people are going, oh my God, you were the night mother. You scared the crap out of me. And so it's like you never realize what you're doing until it's done. And sometimes you never see 
what it is until after it's done. It's great to be able to find a clip, but most of the time, if it's a game, you're watching and listening to someone do a walkthrough. So you're listening to this guy go, okay, we're going to go over here. And you're trying to listen in the background to the end boss or something that you did. And I really love being end bosses and monsters and you, you know, all of the little creature things. And I really have to thank Blizzard a lot for bringing me in for several things like that. And I wish they'd do it more. Blizzard is such a great company and I've always been a big fan of them. More people today work there than ever before because there's such a growing market, but it's still such a small industry when you really think about it. And that being the case, I mean, how, how important is reputation as it pertains to longevity in the field? Having a good reputation is great, and I presume and I'm thankful that I do have a good reputation because, you know, one app, bad apple or one bad experience can ruin the whole bunch. But, uh, for example, being a prima donna or being difficult to work with, all those kinds of things make it difficult for me to want to work with other people that I cast as a casting director. But I'd also say that because the industry is like a turnstile industry – there isn't a lot of loyalty sometimes that you would expect because let's say a producer goes and works for another company. Well, they're kind of the low man on the totem pole over there, so they don't want to upset the apple cart. So it's not as easy as it might seem. Someone with my amount of work behind me um, doesn't always get the boost towards going to another company when someone I've worked for moves to that new company. There, there's so much to take in consideration. I mean, what we're really talking about here is the entertainment industry, whether it's voice acting, animation, film, effects. You know, you have to deal with every issue that everybody else in the entertainment industry deals with. What attracted you to this industry in the first place? I had no friends when I was a kid, so I had to make them up. Uh, I was always a pretty much a class clown because I think that I wasn't challenged mentally a lot in the classes that I, I would have. So I would imitate and mimic things. And uh, trust me, I had many years where I was working in management and retail at Warehouse Records and managed a high-end stereo store and did real estate. Then I got into radio and morning drive where you had to be characters of whoever's in the news and, and the weirdest stuff. Like uh, they'd say, uh, this is the first day of the lottery, so make up something like Dr. Ruth telling you how to choose lottery numbers based on something sexual. And so I was overheard doing some of my voices by a company called GTE Magitrack that was actually pitching the laser disc at that time. Let's go way back to Philips and Magnavox. And they asked me if I could do some voices from Fern Gully. I had no idea that Fern Gully was a movie. And I went up there and did a bunch of voices. And they told me, hey, the people downstairs are doing kids' CD-ROMs. I didn't even know what a CD-ROM was. And I started actually writing and doing voices of inanimate objects like Where's Waldo? So I had to be talking lampshades. And so kids could, you know, crayons and bath sponges and all kinds of weird things. And then I said, who else does this? I don't know. And me being of a producer type, I said, where would I find out? And they said, go to CES, Consumer Electronics Show. I did that for two years. I went to the Game Developers Conference. I went to Electronic Entertainment Expo for 13 years. So that's where I kind of, you know what I started? I, I believe that I always want to do cartoons. And so I thought, well, I'll let myself get into a couple of games and then I'll get a demo reel and capture some of this stuff. But back in those days, you couldn't really capture anything because you didn't know when you were going to come up. You'd have to take everything on a VCR or something, you know. So I just got in that stuck in that, that rut because one thing led to another. But that's exactly how it started is me being overheard and starting to do games. Wow. So you, you were actually discovered. That, <laughs> that just doesn't happen anymore. I wish. I would actually say uh, I worked hard to become on Morning Drive. I did plague the, the production you know, director that was there and everybody there until I finally got hired on as a producer. So I did push myself because it was a really cool uh, industrial rock of the 80s kind of a station. I even had to work in Tijuana every morning. But uh, because I wanted to do that, that's really how I did have to work hard to get that job and it was just from that job that it ended up going into games as far as the lifestyle of what you do what's your average work week look like 
My inbox controls my whole day, <laughs> especially if you're on the pay-to-play sites and they send you like 20, 30, and you have to rush to beat out 20, 50 other people that are trying to beat you to the audition. You know, I really don't want a life because my life is work. So I'd say that from the moment I get up and turn the computer on, it's, it's auditions, it's auditions, it's auditions. If you go and do other work, you know, sometimes I'll have to drive 150 miles to go and, and work in another studio, what have you. It's, it just consumes your life. And being that I work with worldwide clients where there's quite a time difference, <laughs> there really is no sleep for me. I get about three hours of sleep a night. How do you manage to, to operate on three hours of sleep? I'm a zombie. <laughs> Some good coffee uh, in Southern California, I take it. No, uh, Diet Coke. <laughs> Diet Coke. Diet Coke is your is your drug of choice, eh? That's right. <laughs> well, hey, whatever works for you, and, and apparently it is working because you know you're, you're you're constantly booked. It seems almost every week uh, another game comes up, or a commercial, or something pops up where where your voice is on there that I didn't even recognize before. So, as a casting director too, and I'll get games thrown at me on a Friday night. Uh, with say 63 characters and I'm supposed to cast it and have the schedule arranged with all the people I cast to record on that next Monday. And so that takes care of the weekends. Uh, having done this for so long and on so many projects and having so many credentials, is there still something about what you do that still gives you those chills? Like maybe when you first started, you know, I would say, yes, I always look at something as a new challenge that I'm so grateful to have a chance to do something that's different. Uh, and even to sing, I've had to make up songs, you know, without any music track in some alien nightclub singer. You know, that this is always such a neat thing that I can go out of the box instead of getting the typical YouTube references for Angelina Jolie or Uma Thurman in Kill Bill that says, oh, I'll just have to kill you. But you know what really is thrilling? If I ever do get a chance to see the outcome, the actual product with a voice in it, that is what gives me goosebumps. Back, uh, rewinding uh, just a little bit, you mentioned before that you sometimes have to drive as much as 150 miles, you know, for, for an audition or a gig. Do you typically do outbound work? Do you go to the studio? Do you record from home? Or, or what does it usually look like? I'd say 90% of what I do, we record from home. I also, when I'm directing a game and employing people all over the country or world, we direct via Skype. And so I don't have to normally go to an outside studio. The world is becoming much a smaller place when we have all these electronic things to our uh, ability to use. But yes, I, I have had to do all of it. I've had to go to studios. I've, I've recorded here. Uh, so it doesn't really matter. You just have to be flexible, but you also have to be your own engineer when you're a voice talent and you use your home deal. That's why a lot of people who stick them in themselves in a booth or some box, you know, that has padding on it, they don't have their computer right there. So they can't ride the gain. In other words, if I'm going, get away from her, you bitch, and I don't want it to clip, I have to be able to control that volume knob. So there are a lot of people that get into this business that don't know how to run software, don't know how to, you know, either make a good sound recording or, or work the the engineering part of it. And that's part of it that, that you really need to do, especially with this world being, like I said, with the subscriberships and the way that you have to do auditions. They don't want to pay a studio to have you go in and audition at the studio. Nobody does that anymore. And sometimes an agent will allow you to go into their agency to record, but they don't like doing that anymore. That's an inconvenience for them. So you really have to be set up at home even just to do auditions. What do you enjoy more? Do you enjoy voice acting, directing, or even training more? <laughs> I'd say probably it's – it's enjoy is a funny word. I, I really like to work. But it's not, you know, when people think of voice acting, a lot of people get in this business thinking, oh, it would be fun to do voices or I have a very good voice. People have told me I should get in the business, you know, and that's the quote unquote fun that everyone envisions that we have. And while it is really an enjoyable thing, you know, it's it's work. And sometimes when you have to do your deaths and your attacks and <laughs> you're going to get hoarse, you can lose your voice, you can, you can have a heart attack practically when you're performing. But directing i i sometimes direct in the same voice as the person i'm directing so it's not any less difficult 
but I think that I'm a good technologist. I can teach people to, if you're trying to do an orc, how to bring your mouth forward. If you want to sound like a boy, you put your lips forward like this because this is the same voice, but if I bring my lips back to my teeth, I sound like a female. So I can teach people this. I don't make my living coaching. It's a matter of I am here to help. I'm here to help a client for their project. I'm here to help an actor to perform, and I'm here to do the best job I can. So in terms of weighing one over the other, I do more of is probably acting and directing. But, um, yeah, I, I don't mind teaching. I'm just a little bit too generous with my time. <laughs> <laughs> Any new up-and-comers that are interested and in maybe looking into this field or they're determined and really want to break into the scene, can you give them any tips? Yes. Mainly, if you're going to get coaching, look on IMDb or try to find out what this person is actually doing. Are they a casting director? Hollywood is often known for what we call the paid audition, where you take a class by a casting person simply to be seen by that person. You may not learn anything, but it's a way to have that exposure. And then the other thing is, if you feel more comfortable doing just speaking, uh, instead of the big action kind of things, you don't want to ruin your voice. Find the genre that is in that vein, whether it be audiobooks or thank you for calling Bridge and Water lawyers or whatever. You know, you can do IBR. You can do many other things. Uh, you can start out reading for the blind. You could go on a PBS station, volunteer. Then people will hear you. So the worst thing I can say is taking a class for a lot of money, and some of these coaches actually. Also promote them doing your demo or you feel like, hey, I've, I've taken my six weeks course and uh, I'm qualified. I'm going to put that demo out. And I'm going to start sending that demo to a million people out there. Wrong. Because demos are always edited to make people sound usually better than they are. You normally don't want any demo to be more than a minute and a half. And if a person like myself has, God grief, like 300, 400 voices, I can't possibly put that on there. And also, a demo can maybe not be as good as you might be. So maybe if someone is looking for an Indian guy, but they, you know, they don't hear it on your demo and they think you can't do it. So that is a problem with demos that, that people just initially, they take a couple classes, they got to get their demo out. Well, remember this. Most of us people that get these links, hey, go listen to my demo. If you're like me, a lot of these people in, don't even want to listen to it, but I will listen to it. However, I will tell every single person that emails me, I do not depend on demos to judge how much voice control do you have. If I direct you, how directable are you? If I say, can you add some texture with that? Do you know what I'm talking about? Um, texture meaning like this. Uh, also, are you a prima donna? You know, do you have an attitude? Don't line read me. I want to bring my own nuance. <laughs> Try to get mentors that are of an opposite sex because the competition is fierce. Get their advice, but take it with a grain of salt and get it from more than one person. Many people will tell you to get a large diaphragm mic, which makes you go into a closet or a booth. And you can get away with a sure SM58 for 99 bucks. And if you want to use it without a preamp, you can get something called a Shure X2U, which is also 99 bucks that allows you to go into a USB port. You can hold this in your hand. You can talk right in front of your computer. It won't pick up any noise. It has a pop filter built right in, and you can thereby do auditions kabang kaboom for an initial investment of $200 or less and buy it on eBay. There's a lot of people that get and invest a whole lot of money into things that just cost more money. Well, I do do coaching, and I could give you the link to that. Um, it's $250 for pretty much unlimited, which nobody else does, and I have a money-back guarantee. And I will only coach what is needed, like what accents are used in the industry or how to give yourself – a broader library. If you're a girl that can only talk like this, I want you to be able to talk like something else so you could get more than one part. Most games, you can't hire somebody one person per part because there are not enough lines to validate the expenditure. So you have to be a versatile person. Also, many people will tell you if you're going to do animation, you must live in Los Angeles. If you are going to do looping, you might have to do it at the studio where they have the footage. They may not want to release the footage that you're going to do 
you know, audio dialogue replacement or ADR over the Japanese, for example, footage. There are also other ADR studios in Texas, and doing ADR or looping is a whole other industry. It's kind of harder, but it may not have as high of a bar. You know, like you don't have to be Mel Blanc or June Ferre or whatever. Uh, they tend to use a different set. And these actors, I'm not trying to discredit them. They have their own conventions that they go to and have as much celebrity status as many of the other people do. But when you get the three beeps, beep, 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 and you have to do it as poorly or as the timing as they did it, it's different than being able to conjure up something from original. So in a way, it's harder to do, but that's a whole other genre that maybe people can look into that. They can take maybe some training for looping. And if they do live in areas like Los Angeles, Texas, or areas which, which do do looping, that can happen a little bit in New York. That's another way to possibly look into it. Excellent. Now, Lonnie, there's, there's a bit that you did uh, one of the first times that we talked on the phone years ago, and it just blew me away. And if you would indulge me and our listeners, it was a bit that you did where you started out as a baby. And this is right. all the fly, if I recall, all improv on the spot. You just kind of pulled this out of thin air and ended up as a, as a senior citizen <laughs> pr- practically in one breath. Okay. If I can put you on the spot and you don't mind, no I would love to, to have a recording of this for, for posterity. Sure. We all start out as babies. And then as days go by, we get a little older and we're told we shouldn't cry. We go through school trying to be cool. And then we graduate. Some of us might be mommies. Others work or even date. As we grow old, we wonder, were we smart or just a fool? Now some of us are back in diapers again, and others even drool. <laughs> Excellent. And I I promise to everyone that's that's listening to this that was done in one take. There was no <laughs> there was no editing, nothing was spliced together, there were no gaps. That was pure uh, Lottie Manella right there. Thank you so Thank you much. Thank you very much, darling. Uh, good luck, bad luck, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. And now, do you ever lose track of your actual voice having all these yes. things kicking inside of your head? Do you wake up one day and, and not even remember what you sound like? Because when you wake up, of course, you sound like Lauren Bacall. <laughs> And then as the days go by, it depends. You ever notice when people talk on the phone, they kind of get a little monotone and na 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 na. I get that a lot when I'm getting people asking for sound alikes. You know, like here's Ashley Judd and, and here's uh, Cameron Diaz, and they're just kind of like talking like this and na 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 na. Well, so if someone says, just use your normal voice. Well. What normal voice, you know, because a normal voice can just depend on the time of day. So it's usually more fun to to do something other than myself. So if you were stuck, if something happened and you got stuck in one of your three or four hundred voices for the rest of your life, but you couldn't have your own voice anymore, which one would it be? That's a great question. I couldn't have my own voice? Right. Well, I'd probably be something very wicked, evil, mean, and bad and nasty, or... Because then nobody would ever keep asking me questions. (laughs) They would not know what you were talking about. Exactly. Oh, that would be excellent. You you would definitely get some interesting looks. I know, but I don't do this much in public. I don't like to draw attention to myself. (laughs) I'm actually a shy person. I just perform when the switch has to go on. So I think that, again, uh, one thing we didn't talk about, which is really important for any actor that wants to really bring action, is to use a lot of body gestures, which is unlike the training that you get for working on camera and on screen, where they tell you don't over-exaggerate or you're going to look like Jim Carrey and that's too artificial, and while he gets away with it, nobody else can. (laughs) So in games and animation, it really helps if you do over-exaggerate and move your body. Yeah, you have to know how to keep your mouth still on axis with a mic, but doing these over-gestures, let me tell you, if you are seen by someone doing this, they're going to think, wow, that person's good. And it really does help in the performance. 
Oh, I couldn't agree more. And and that's that's a very, very good point. And that's very profound because whenever we work on projects, uh, and if I'm coaching or training animators or we're directing something, we always try to tell people, think theater. Don't think film. You want to you wanna overdo it, you know, it, even to the point where you feel that you may be a little campy or a little corny. That that lets you know that you're on the right path. You want to overdo it when you're doing animation. And it's an interesting parallel between that and what you say about voice acting, because to really come through, whether it's audio or visual, uh, when when your creative juices are defining the quality of of the audio or or the animation, you really have to push it. Well, this is especially true when we have to do games that require emotes like death and da- and dying, attack, screaming. I've even been asked to, you do a somersault and then you roll and you have to make up a, a sound, you know, for this. And so you can't just go, uh, ah, eh, eh. You have to really just, you have to use your body and do these punches and these attacks. And I always say, what weapons are we using? And in the old days, it was action specific. You're dying by jumping into a vat of hot lava. Uh, you're having your throat slit or, uh, or you use consonants for the attack, like, you know, but I like to make up new words like MLA. It, it, you don't want to necessarily make it sound like an English word because often localization, they don't want you to, you know, say anything that has to be translated. But those kind of things are what nobody teaches. Those are the kind of things I see so much of a dearth when I know that they're going to use the same emotes for the various characters and maybe just pitch them down. You must be a telemarketer's worst nightmare. No. I, I can't, I, or, or maybe you, you probably, I, I, I hesitate to think that you might welcome strangers calling you on the phone. I, I can't imagine what they may meet on the other end. I don't do that because I treat people the way I want to be treated. And I would, and also usually when I'm getting these robocalls, there's not even a live person on the other end. So <laughs> if I say hello and wait a couple minutes, if nobody says anything, I hang up. But no, I used to have to do prank calls when I worked on the radio station. I did not like that. Um, it's, it's just, um, again, I, I have this icky feeling when I'm trying to be something that I'm not. But uh, no, I've never done that. And oh, I had it backfire once. I was trying to get a part as a co-host of a morning show. And they were doing interviews. And I couldn't get in. I, I, I just for some reason, I tried and called, called, called. Finally, I called as Joan Rivers. Hello, this is Joan Rivers. I'd like to come in and audition for your show. Oh, Joan. Oh, my goodness. We'd love to have you. Oh, let, let me ask you, when, when are the times that I can come in? And they told me, I go, oh, you know, oh, oh, I'm so busy. <clears throat> I can't come. Can I send my assistant? She's really, really good. And they said, oh, okay. And I said her name, <laughs> you know, her name is Lonnie Manella. And I booked it. And then I, I felt so bad. I called right back. Hi, this is Joan Rivers again. I had to just tell you, I don't like making anybody, you know, I don't joke around like that. This is really Lonnie. I'm sorry I did that to you. And <laughs> I got the one minute cursory interview and kicked out the door. Oh, no. But that shows you how something can backfire. I, I would, <laughs> if if I had if I had the chops you did, I don't know if I could resist that temptation to play. Well, with, you know what it all time. boils down to: lack of time to spare. <laughs> there you, go. you have better <laughs> things to do than to than to play with telemarketers. Yeah, I say what? I can't hear you. What? Can you speak <laughs> up? Well, hang on a minute. I gotta go to the bathroom, and then you leave them, you know, for ten minutes. Hang on. I just couldn't do that because I have to get on with my work. But it's a good idea. Any, any closing uh, words of wisdom from any of your voices? <laughs> well, it's mind over matter, you dear. You see, if you don't mind, it doesn't matter. And keep up the faith and keep up the good work. And don't let the little people and the problem people and the people that don't know what they're doing get you down. Excellent. Thank you so much, Lana, for your time. Thank I really you. appreciate it. It's my pleasure.